got away from the city where the higher rise buildings are and went out to a village and said virtually the whole church is out there. Like 30 people have descended on one person's house in a village because they fear for their lives in the city. And if you've ever traveled in that part of the world, in most of the places they build like anywhere between four and maybe 10 story buildings that all have like four apartments inside. And they'll be like three bedroom apartments. So I mean, they're fairly big. They have you know living room, kitchen, dining room, three bedrooms. So they're fairly big, but they build them literally like less than six feet apart. They're just like right on top of each other. And when these things come down, if you see some of the pictures on the news where the buildings have just collapsed, I mean, even if it happens to the building next door, it can really damage your, your building. He says, Need, needless to say, we are still in shock and quite terrified to be honest. Um, thankfully, we are at what seems to be about the safest place around. And I think he texted Mike and said their biggest need might be for blankets and clothes and things to keep warm. So I just wanted to start off tonight. So again, it's Jeffrey and Rachel. I want to give you guys an opportunity just to lead in prayer. And I'll, if somebody's willing to just lead in prayer, I'll hand you the mic and just pray for them because of the situation that they're facing. So, looking for a volunteer, don't be shy. I'll hand it off to Myron if nobody stands up. But Anybody wanna pray? All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you tonight on behalf of uh, Jeffrey and Rachel, and the many others in Turkey and Syria, um, parts of other countries as well that have been affected so greatly by this earthquake. Lord, we just, uh, we, it's hard for us to, to fathom the devastation and the things that they're experiencing. But God, I pray that uh, all of them uh, would experience you, would sense your presence, feel your nearness. And God, that's, that somehow in the midst of this, that their basic needs could be met, uh, that uh, those that are trapped uh, would still be found, Lord, and, and just in the days and the weeks ahead for those that have lost loved ones, so many of them, so many families, God, that you'll be with them in the grieving process. Lord, to pray as well for those uh, who are there to help from different agencies, uh, different places, um, workers that have come to, to assist. Just It can be very devastating for them as well to see those kinds of things. So just pray your protection upon them, your hand upon them as well. And again, Father, we just commit uh, this whole situation to you and pray that uh, through it all somehow, Father, you would be honored and you would be glorified. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. And um, obviously, we just encourage you to keep them in prayer. Now, Mike promised you we would do a couple more giveaways tonight. We'll let the, whoever, whoever wins the first question can choose whether they want a, a tumbler or a, a bag from RI. Um, so the first question we're going to ask is from our table. We have one person who has the word Africa on his or her prayer card out there on the lobby. Tell me the name of this person who works in Africa with Rosedale International. We got it. Devin Weaver, what would you like, a bag or a tumbler? The bag? Very good, thank you. So Devin Weaver, he's working in Ivory Coast or the French name Cote d'Ivoire. All right. Second question from what I shared. What was the very first temptation that Satan gave to Eve? Doubt of what? You got it. Good answer. Glad to see there's a young person paying attention. Tonight we're going to follow up and begin to, to talk a bit more about the idea of missional living. Um, I think it's always good to read the Word of God before we get started and just to kind of declare the Word of God over our meeting tonight. I think speaking His Word, reminding ourselves of what we believe is always a good thing, and publicly reading 
scripture. So I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 2 and read the first 10 verses here. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, which were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, years ago, Watchman Nee wrote a little book that he titled Sit, Walk, and Stand that is the outline for the book of Ephesians. We are seated with Christ. We've been chosen by God and seated with Christ in heavenly places. Christ has already paid the price for our salvation. And because of that, we are seated with him, meaning that work of salvation is complete. Then the second thing was to walk. And this passage is talking about it how we walk, how we live out the salvation that we've already received, and how we walk out what God's called us to be, workmanship, the handiwork of God. And finally, that we need to stand, and that comes from Ephesians chapter 6, where it's talking about the spiritual armor that we need to put on, and we need to stand in the evil day against Satan's schemes. But anyway, we're going to talk about this a little bit more in the, the next couple of nights. Tonight, Mike's going to be dealing with the elements of the faith that come from um, Acts chapter 2. And I'm going to just pray for Mike before he gets up and talks to us. Lord, I thank you tonight that we have a chance to listen to your word being taught. I want to just lift Mike up before you tonight. I pray that your Holy Spirit would anoint him. I pray that your word would go forth with power, that your Holy Spirit would accomplish what you desire in each one of our hearts, and that your word would prosper as you want it to prosper in each one of our lives. We pray that each one who listens would take to heart what the Spirit is saying to the church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you guys hear me? I can hear me, so that's good. Um, yeah, it's kind of been a little bit of a heavy day for us as we've been communicating a little bit with Jeffrey and Rachel and praying for them. And I, I don't know if you guys have ever been through any kind of disasters or natural disasters or what, so I don't, I don't want to assume you have or haven't, but I know, just want to encourage you guys to keep praying for them and the area and people. I know when we lived in West Africa, we walked through the Ebola crisis, and um, when you're in those kind of situations, the stress that you're under, you don't even realize how much it tolls on your body. I think all in all, I lost over 65 pounds during the Ebola crisis because I just wasn't eating. I was, I mean, we were so, not even realizing, we were just so living in fear um, because the symptoms were exactly like malaria, and it was malaria season, and so like every time we got on a public transport, you wondered if you were going to be exposed. So anyway, all that to be said, um, just continue to remember them, their church, that area, just for the physical, emotional, spiritual needs. Um, when we finally got evacuated, we, we literally, I'm not kidding you, slept for like a week straight, um, just of pure exhaustion, and uh, I was telling Jerry this morning, I... 
when Jeffrey said he was just fearful, like I remember that same feeling. So we were, we were back in the States. We'd been evacuated. We're at these, we are at a doctor's house, which was unknown to us, planned by our MST to take us there just in case we had been exposed to Ebola. And um, we're sitting there eating breakfast after our long winter's nap. And um, our, our six-year-old just like coughs and sneezes and like blood came out of her mouth. And like you could have heard a pin drop in that kitchen. Because every single one of us was instantly like, oh my goodness, like does she have Ebola? And like we sat there for a minute and thankfully the, the, the doctor, just being a sound-minded man, he was served on our MST, a uh, godly man goes, guys, we're all fine. <laughs> like you've been in a warm climate, it's very cold here, it's winter, it's a you know, dry nose. And he was right, we were fine, but just that moment of just pure fear just ran through our body. And so um, I say that to, to just say, let's continue to remember the Eberleys. I also will say this, even though we were evacuated, not by our choice, but by our mission agency's choice, like we went back. And probably the, the best thing that ever happened was us going back. And it just bonded us to that village. Um, and we had some other situations that happened too. We actually almost lost a daughter to pink eye. Um, but I mean, we were just so bonded, and, and I was telling Jerry, I, I really pray that this just bonds Jeffrey and Rachel to the church and to that area, because when you go through crisis together, it just really unites, unites people. And again, maybe you've experienced that, and you know that. So just that was in my mind, and I just wanted to share it, because I'm a little ADHD when it comes to stuff like that. Um, but yeah, this evening, so Jerry laid this amazing foundation for us. Uh, thank you very much, Jerry. And, um, and we kind of stopped at like Jesus last night, which is a good place to stop. And so tonight we want to pick up uh, a little bit, not a little bit, we want to pick up in Acts uh, chapter 2, and we're going to kind of look at the early church. And so, you know, we, we talked about that God had this covenant with his people and he wanted his people to be redeeming people. And honestly, Israel failed at that. We, we know that Israel failed failed at that. They even, even in, in when they were crucifying Jesus, they said, bring curses down on us. You know, we want this man to die. And so that, so this redeeming for now has been transferred to the church. Like we are now that chosen people. We are, Israel still a chosen people. And we know that according to scriptures, at some point in time, they're going to be restored and finally fulfill what they never did. But right now it's, it's the church's job. And so we are in the, this world of redeeming and sharing and building relationships. And I believe if we look in Acts 2.42, um, we begin to see some things that the early church did. And I think they did them well. Did they do them perfectly? No. Because why? We're human, right? None of us are perfect. Nothing is ever done perfect. I mean, as you walk through the book of Acts, you see some conflict. Peter got yelled at for eating in a Gentile's house and... Paul and Peter had some conflict. I mean, there was conflict in the early church, uh, but they continued to move forward and spread the gospel. And, and at the end of the day, my personal opinion is at times in the church, why we don't live missionally, why we don't do things well is because we have to build relationships to do this. And anytime we build a relationship, it's going to get messy, right? Like every single one of us in the room, if we said our story right now, we've all been hurt by a relationship. At least I'm assuming that. Maybe not like small kids yet, um, but, but probably even a sibling. And so, I mean, I've been hurt by relationships. I've been, I've been cheated. I've been swindled. I've been backstabbed. I've been lied to. I mean, I've been hurt and relationships are messy, um, but they're necessary. Like we, we can't share the gospel. We can't be missional if we're not willing to build relationships. And unfortunately, if we're willing to build relationships, at some point in time, it's, it's just going to get messy. And sometimes wading through that mess is, is the hardest part of what is truth and what is not truth. And, and again, leaning on the Holy Spirit in those times. Um, so I, I want to be completely honest. This, this sermon that I'm sharing with you tonight is not new. Um, I grew up in church. I grew up going to a Christian school, um, but in, in 90s lingo, because I'm, I'm a 90s, 80s, 90s child, and I was a player. Um, if you don't know what that means, good. Um, but I was, a, I was a fake. I was a poser. I was whatever term you want to call it. Like, I had all the right answers. I knew all the right things to say. I got all A's in Bible class. I could answer every single Sunday school question. Um, 
But my heart wasn't there. My heart was constantly yearning for the things of the world. And my mind was constantly saying, but no, you have to do these things. And so there was this internal battle in me for a very long time. And I'd have these moments of like, yes, I'm all in. And then, and then I'd regress. And I've had these moments of, yes, I'm all in. And then I'd regress. Um, and this, this carried on even to one, my first few years working as a youth pastor. Like just this internal battle that I was fighting. And I never necessarily acted upon anything. I didn't, I didn't as a youth pastor, I, I didn't cross those lines. But I was always just battling myself. I wanted to be famous. I wanted to be rich. I wanted... In Indiana, everyone had a lake house. I wanted a lake house. Uh, I wanted the sea dew. Um, you know, I wanted all these things, and yet I also knew that God had called me to ministry. And I knew what ministry meant. I knew ministry was hard. There would be suffering. There definitely wouldn't be a lake house. Um, there'd probably be some days where I wasn't sure where the food's going to come from. Um, and that at times it would get messy because. People tend to blame someone, and unfortunately, when you're in ministry, sometimes that person is you. Um, and so I'd seen this growing up, and so I was constantly running like, like Jonah. And so I just want to be as transparent as ever. I always try to be as transparent as ever. And so this sermon series was actually, and now I've tweaked it over the years, and I've added to it, and it's got better elements and graphics. And by the way, Toby Mac did not ask my permission to make a song based on this series. So I, I, I feel like I should get some money from him or something. But um, again, if you know who Tony Mac is and you have a little bit of idea what kind of music I listen to. Um, but so it was, it was 2007 and I was a youth pastor in Fort Wayne at a, at a mega church. I did not grow up in the Mennonite world. I'll be honest, I had no idea what a Mennonite was until I was 28 years old. Um, and when the one guy asked me to come, come to their church, I asked if I needed to get a horse. So that was my understanding of what a Mennonite was. Um, so I, I grew up in this, this mega church that was started by David Jeremiah, uh, had gone to school there all my life, and was, was the junior high pastor at this church. And um, we had 150 plus kids in our junior high ministry, yada, yada, yada. Life was supposedly good. And um, our ministry was dead. Like it was just dead. Like, we look back on it, and we called it Velcro Ministry. So you'd, you'd do these big events, and you'd try to, like, get kids to stick. Um, like, Fear Factor was big back then, and these other events. And, you know, I, sometimes I felt like, literally, we had these Velcro walls, and we were trying to get kids to stick to it. And it just did not work. And so there was five of us, you guys in the area, that got together one Saturday, and we were just fed up with keeping up with the Joneses, the, the megachurch mentality, um, that, that was never enough, the status quo. And we're like, what do we need to do to get these kids to understand who Jesus was and who Jesus is? And I think some of it is in our own lives, we were finally beginning to surrender. We were all in ministry. We were all pretty young in ministry. We were all married, had kids. And like we were beginning to understand what that, that was like. So this like whole sermon series kind of came out of my own personal journey of surrendering everything to God. Um, and so this is probably more than you need to know, but, but I want you to know it. So, um, and so we had this weekend, and, and we got together, and we talked, and, th and this was birthed out of that, uh, this sermon series. And, and so we took it, and we began to implement it in our youth groups. And it was amazing, the transformation that we saw. And kids were like, wow, you guys are being real with us. Like, you're not being fake. Like, like this is, like, you're pushing us, you're challenging us. And, and I, you know, I began to realize that sometimes we have the bar too low, and, and we just began to raise that bar. Now, did every kid like it? No. Did every kid adapt to it? No. Did we still have those kids that were okay being fake? Yeah, we did. Um, but it was just amazing to see this, this transformation, and, and then in my own life as well. And, and so in this process, uh, my wife and I got to the point where we're just like, God, we're done running. Whatever you want we're yours. Like, we are your vessels. Like, we will go wherever you want. And our family now has a saying, God, wherever you lead us, we will follow. And whatever you feed us, we will swallow. Now, I'm going to tell you, do not say that prayer unless you mean it. Um, because I've eaten monkey brains. So, you know, I'm just saying. I don't know that that was the wisest thing to say. But, but anyway, uh, we just, we laid, our, we laid our hearts out. And it was at that point in time that God just really began to change and we surrendered all and from that time on we left Indiana 
we joined the Anabaptist world. We, we were, worked in Pennsylvania for, for many years, and then we're overseas in West Africa. And then I have pastored a church uh, in Missouri with CMC, and, and now I'm at RI. So we have. We've moved several times. We've lived in different places. We've swallowed lots of different things. Um, but that's been our journey. And in that, we have lived missionally in each of those places. Um, and that's not your journey. That's, that's my journey. Um, but that's kind of, that's where this sermon came out of. Um, and so, as you guys know, if you've ever paid attention in school, if you ever paid attention in science class, like, elements make up our world, right? Like, who can tell me what makes up H2O? Someone said it, hydrogen, oxygen, right? Two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen, right? Water is known as H2O. Uh, I don't know if you guys liked science. I loved science as a kid. I loved the periodic table. One of my favorite things to do in chemistry was balancing equations and balancing uh, the things. And, and our world is made up of elements, right? It, it's, all, it's made up of all these different elements. Uh, we've got hydrogen, we've got oxygen, we've got nitrogen, we've got helium, we've got sodium, all these different things. And they make up the basic fundamentals of our world. And so... Like, in that thought, thought process, I'm like, what are, these, what, are the, what are the things that make up our faith? Um, and as I looked at Acts 2.42, and as I spent time there, I began to see these elements of faith, these foundational pieces of our faith, but also of the early church. Now, I just, na- I just named five. You could name more. Uh, you could probably make subcategories of them. But we're just going to look at five things tonight. And I think that these should be a part of our faith. I think they should be a part of our lives our families, our churches, and I think as we do these things well, missional living begins to come out of us and somewhat, somewhat naturally, um, no matter where we're living, no matter what we're at. And that's one caveat that, that I, think, I think you know from Jerry and I, and if you don't, I want to say it. Obviously at RI, we, we love sending people, and we want to send people, but more importantly, we want to equip you to be sent right where you're at, Right? Every single one of you has a gift, and we're going to look at that tomorrow, and we already alluded to it in Ephesians 2.10, like every single one of you is a masterpiece built, given good works in advance by our God and by our Creator to do those good works. And so our job is not to say, hey, you all need to go to Turkey, or you all need to go to Morocco, or you all, no, no. You need to be exactly where God wants you to be and be living missionally exactly where God wants you to be. And for some of you, that might be Turkey or West Africa. And for some of you, it's going to be New York. And for some of you, it may be somewhere else altogether. And that, that's my wish and desire is that the churches of CMC are willing to say, God, use me. I have these gifts. You've given me these good works. You've prepared me. Use me. And that each one of us is being used. And I believe then we really see that body of Christ come together. The hands and the feet and the eyes and the ears and all the different pieces. Um, and I mean, that's, that's my heart's desire. And I know that's Jerry's as well. Yeah, if you want to go, we want to send. But more importantly, we want you to be sent right where you're at. And be being, using your gifts right where you're at. So just want to kind of start off with that. And so... Again, we already kind of talked about that, the elements. So there are five elements that make up a person who desires to pattern their life after Christ. Again, you can debate me later. You can add some. You can take away some. I'm totally cool with that. I just want, as long as you're listening, then, then we're winning. So, um, and these are, these are more than just beliefs or window dressings. Um, these are things that I think need to be the foundation of our journey through life. And so something that, that like, came out of this for my life and for our family's life was embrace and pursue God during every season of life. And I, and I think when we're grounded in the elements that we're going to look at here, we can embrace and pursue God because, right, seasons of life are tough. There are good seasons and bad seasons. I mean, like when Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes and he said there's a time for everything and he goes through in 11 verses just listing all these different things, like a lot of us ex- have experienced most of those things. Right? There's time of laughter, there's time of joy, there's time of sorrow, there's time of mourning, there's time of plenty, there's time of like, how are we going to fill the refrigerator? Um, life is tough. But if we're embracing and pursuing God during every season of life and not ourselves, and not our own strengths, and not the economy, and not our wallets, like we survive and we thrive. So embrace and pursue God during every season of life. And so I'm just going to read from Acts 2.42. It's also on the screen. 
Or you can follow along in your Bible. I'm going to be reading from the, from the ESV. This is the fellowship of believers. It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. <clears throat> and it all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And so if, if, you, if you go back in the beginning of Acts, we know that in the, in the room, as they waited on the Holy Spirit, it tells us there was 120 people. So the early church was 120 people before the coming of the Holy Spirit in chapter 2, and all these people came to know Christ. So we had the disciples, we had Jesus' mother, it says his brothers, it says the other women that traveled with him, and clearly some other people, like Barnabas, like Mark, like some of these guys that wrote books of the Bible. And so, you know, by the time we get to chapter 2, that group number has grown a little bit, but this started with 120 people. And in 11 verse 42, it says, and they devoted themselves... They devoted themselves. And my question before we, we dive into this is, what are you devoted to? We're all devoted to something. What are you devoted to? Are you devoted to your marriage? I hope so. Are you devoted to your career? That's not a bad thing to be devoted to. Are you devoted to sports? Probably, some of us are, right? What are we devoted to? And the reality is we're going to be devoted to lots of different things. But first and foremost, are we devoted to God above all those things? And sometimes I think the answer is no, we're not. And my experience in ministry over the last 23 years is God tends to take back seat until crisis shows up. And God tends to get forget it, forget it, forget it? Yeah, I'm educated. God tends to get forgotten about until crisis shows up. So what are we devoted to? The early church was devoted to the Lord and the church. Um, and not in a bad way. Not, not, not in an idol, like an idol way. But, but they were devoted to each other and to what Jesus had taught them. So what are we devoted to? That word devoted means like you are going to do it no matter what. Like nothing's going to stop you. And um, I, I have become a runner in the last few years, and I'm definitely devoted to running. And it is killing me that I can't run right now because I don't know any trails. I'm guessing all the trails are covered in snow, and I'm not super confident about running on a road where people are driving 55 miles per hour. Um, so I was like, I, I just I run like four or five times a week. Um, generally, if I go out and run, I'm running at least four or five miles a pop, and it's like. I was like pacing in the house today because I'm like, I need to run. I need to run Um, because I'm devoted to that. I I enjoy running. It's my quiet time. I pray. I talk to God. I can eat eat junk food because I'm running. You know, those types of things. Um, But what are you devoted to? If we go to the scripture in verse 42, and the first thing that I wrote down uh, in this, and it's not the first thing in the list. It's actually the last thing in verse 42, but I, I wrote prayer. Right? It says they were devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship of breaking of bread, or to fellowship, sorry, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And so the first thing that, that I chose in this list is, is prayer. Man, I, I think we need to be devoted to prayer. Prayer is a powerful, powerful, powerful thing. And um, I, don't, I don't know where you're at in that. I don't know what that means to you. Can you advance the slides or did I kill it? No. It won't let me go any further, guys. There it is. Thank you. Right there. Awesome. Um, followers in the way of Jesus desire an intimate relationship with God. We pray to him without ceasing, longing to remain connected intimately to Christ. And so what, is prayer, what does prayer mean to you? For me, growing up, I'm going to be honest, like prayer was the thing we did at mealtime, sometimes bedtime, and definitely church time. 
right? And, and again, I'm just going to confess my own junk because it's easy to point myself out. Like the church I grew up with, like the guy that prayed, there were certain words that he just used as like pronouns and he just said them a lot. And, and I like literally as a kid would count how many times the guy said this one word in a prayer. I wasn't listening to the prayer. I was listening to how many times he said this word that it was like his pronoun. And, and so again, that's just me. But this was not something that was a part of my life. The prayer was not something I was devoted to as a young person, even as a teenager. And it was really, again, it, around 28 when I just, we fully surrendered that I recognized the power of prayer. And, and again, I don't know where you're at in that spectrum, but man, to be talking with God, to never cease, never stop this conversation. Like, yes, he knows everything, but he's also our father, right? And, and by us talking to him and sharing with him and saying, God, we care that you're a part of our life. God, we want to be, you to be a part of our life. It's not that he doesn't know, but it's about just being humble and letting that guard down to say, God, I want this intimacy with you. I want this relationship with you. And so being devoted to prayer and I mean, pray over everything. That was definitely one thing that we learned in, in, in leaving our family and leaving our roots in Indiana and, and moving to Pennsylvania and then eventually Africa, like just praying. And, and, you know, God does amazing things. And I just, I could tell story after story of answered prayers and just amazing situations. And I'll, I'll just share two. Um, I remember one time in Pennsylvania, we got, it was a farming community. And so we got together at 5.30 a.m. as men of the church to pray. And so we, were, we had recognized just the, the prayer needed for our families, for our marriages, uh, for the young people in our communities. And so we got together at 5.30 in the morning to pray because that was when time guys could get together before they had to get to work or whatever. And uh, we had this young man, his name was Jason. He actually was my worship leader in the youth. And uh, there was clearly something wrong with him. Like something was not right. He was getting ready to go to the doctor and we all kind of thought it was probably going to be cancer, but we didn't know that for sure. And I just, I just remember that morning, like we all just prayed over him. And like you could feel it, like, you know, the hairs on your arms just stood up and, and the spirit was there and something weird happened and it, all, it felt weird to all of us. I, I don't have good words for it. It's only happened that one time in my life. But Jason left there, went to the doctor and they're like, why did you waste our time? There's nothing wrong with you. Like, you're completely fine. You're completely normal. Um, and I firmly believe in that morning, God healed him because he was not normal before he went to that doctor's appointment. Um, again, it's happened once. I, I haven't had that happen a lot. So I'm not on TV asking for money saying I can heal you because it, it just God used that moment. Um, Another just really might seem silly to you guys, but to me it was huge. When we moved to Guinea-Bissau, uh, West Africa, there was one ATM in the whole country. Uh, so there's 1.3 million people in Guinea-Bissau. It's about the size of Maryland. There, there was one ATM. Um, and so if we needed money, we needed the ATM to work. And so it was kind of a, quite, of a, quite an ordeal to get money. Uh, it was an hour car ride just to get to the ATM. You had to pray that the, the ATM was working. You had to pray that the Wi-Fi was working so you could get the money. Because without the money, you couldn't buy food. Um, there was no credit cards. There was no store credit. There was no, um, hey, I'll get you later. Like you, it was a cash society system um, or their cash. And yeah, we just got to the point that before we went for supplies, we we're like, God, should we take the card? Is it going to work? And Every time he answered, and sometimes he answered, no, it's not going to work. And we would stubbornly take the card anyway. And every single time we stubbornly took that card, and he had told us that the machine wasn't going to work, I'll tell you what, the machine did not work. Um, so again, we just, we just began to pray about everything. And I, I think our lives need to be rooted in that. Because if we're going to begin to build relationships, if we're going to live missionally, if we're going to look at how we can serve in our communities or potentially go somewhere else, if we're not talking to God, if we're not praying with God, if we're not inviting other people to pray with us, how in the world are we going to know what he wants us to do? Because if we leave it to ourselves, we're going to screw it up, right? If I leave it to myself, I'm going to screw it up. 
And so if, if we're not starting here, if we're not asking God to be in our lives and inviting him in and just talking about things, how are we even going to know who we're supposed to begin to talk to or where we're supposed to go or where we're supposed to plant a church or what that may look like? All of those things. It starts with prayer. So the next one, and then we're going to do a little exercise before break. And I'll, I'll just need you guys to advance the slides. I, thank you guys. So the next one is scripture, right? They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. Scripture. We didn't, they didn't have scripture yet. It was the apostles' teaching. The guys are telling stories. They're, they're telling what Jesus did. They're going, man, you're never going to believe. Guys, you guys, I mean, could you just imagine? Sorry, I get so excited about this stuff. But could you just imagine being there in the early church and you've come in and they're just telling the stories of the miracles you know, guys, you remember that time we were like walking on the road and it was the Sabbath and Jesus told us to eat the wheat? And we're like, what? We're going to eat the wheat on the Sabbath? Like, Jesus, we're going to get in so much trouble. And he's like, nah, it's okay. Just, just eat it. Or guys, remember that time we were in that house and all of a sudden there was a hole in the roof and a person came down? And like Jesus told him to get up and walk and he like got up and walked. And he walked out of it like, what was that? Just, just imagine putting yourselves in the shoes of this early church as they're recounting the parables, the stories of all the things that Jesus did. Like, I, I would be excited about those things. I still get excited about the things that have happened in my life that were miracles and, and crazy things happen. Or, or two, like as the, as the parables are all of a sudden like the light bulbs going off, and that's what, exactly why I chose a light bulb. Like, oh my goodness, that's what he meant in that parable. Like, oh, now we get it. Like, oh, duh. Like, how could we not understand that before? Like, this just moment of absolute joy that would have been in the early church as they were just understanding God's word and sharing these stories. And if you guys go to the next slide, followers in the way of Jesus are devoted to learning, embodying, and applying God's word. And I think the last two words are huge. We are really good at learning God's word in the West. We tend to struggle when it comes to embodying and applying. At least, at least I did. And that's the way I was taught. I was taught really well to learn. I was not taught really well to embody and apply. So we're devoted to learning. We're devoted to, devoted to embodying and applying God's word. Right? We pursue this individually and with community. And then we seek out opportunities to apply it. Okay, I, I've heard this. I've understood it. Now, how do I use it? What does that look like? How am I going to use this verse? How, who, who am I going to talk to? How, how am I going to help? What's that going to look like? And so, yeah, we need to study it individually, but man, we also got to be studying it together. In marriages, couples, families, church families, ironing, sharpening iron. There are things that sometimes one of us might understand and get that someone else doesn't. And so we begin to study God's word together. And as we're praying together, we're studying God's word together, the Holy Spirit begins to talk to us. And sometimes, sometimes one of us gets told to do something through someone else, right? Like when we, when, when we originally got called to Africa, it was through my wife and other people. They're like, hey, I think you're supposed to go to Africa. And I was like, why in the world would we go to Africa? That's like the dumbest thing I have ever heard in my life. Pennsylvania is good. And it was like, no, we, we really think you're supposed to go to Africa. I was like... I don't want to go to Africa. It is hot there all the time, and I like snow. You know, I mean, so, like, I, again, I, I, I'm, I'm stubborn. I fight God a lot. I really shouldn't do that. Um, but, again, someone else saw something in us. They, they saw something in our lives. They were, God was speaking to them. And because we were pursuing this with people and with individuals and with community and with a small group, people, again, kind of poke at us and go, we don't really want to lose you. Like, we love what, that you're the youth pastor here, but we really think you need to go to Africa. And we did. And they were right. And we were supposed to go to Africa. But again, are we learning, embodying, and applying God's word? And so, here's what we're going to do. I want you guys, you can stand up or stay seated, I don't care. But I want you to just, with three or four people around you, I want you to just share a favorite verse. What is, what is a verse that has meant something to you? Maybe it's you've applied it. Maybe it's just got you through a tough season. I want to begin to kind of practice some of these things. So before we head to break, before uh, we take that five-minute break, I want you guys just to talk to your neighbors, you know, and more than just you and your spouse, like include people in this, please. 
and just share with each other a favorite verse or, or a favorite way that God has done this in your life, whether embodied it or applied it or shared it. Um, and so, yeah, just take a couple minutes and do that, and then I will dismiss you for break. So you can talk. Go. As you, if you look at that, if you can read that, it says they were devoted to fellowship, to breaking of bread, right? So fellowship and breaking of bread, they were together, they had community, they had fellowship, they were hanging out. Breaking of bread refers to both the Lord's Supper and fellowship meals. You know, so they ate meals together, they shared meals together, they were doing the Lord's Supper together. So many wonder and signs were done. They, had, they were believed they had things in common. They were taking care of each other when there was a need that arise and they saw that. Those that had the means were helping. Those that didn't have the means. Day by day with one mind, they were in the temple. Again, eating meals together, worshiping together. They had community. And I don't think I fully understood what community meant until, I, honestly, I lived in Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, when I was in Pennsylvania in 2000 and, uh, 2009, uh, I had taken the youth group to Honduras on a mission trip with, with, the pro- with the MAMA project. And basically our job was to put concrete floors into mud houses uh, while some, some doctors and nurses did a clinic each day. And... Um, while we were there, one morning, one of, the, one of the youth leaders came up to me and one of the youth kids, who was a senior, and they just said, Mike, we don't know what's going on, but something's happening. We need to pray. I'm like, okay, well, let's pray. So the three of us started praying, having no idea what was happening. And uh, what was happening is back home, my two-year-old daughter uh, had gotten croup. And her airway was much smaller than normal. And so it closed completely. And uh, the the doctors had blown my wife off. We had five kids, so my wife knew what croup was. She knew how to handle croup. Um, But they kind of just, you know, blown her off. And she'd been pretty persistent, and I'm really glad she was. And so Micah was was, actually had been admitted to the hospital for an observation because her O2s were like 78 and they felt like, yeah, we should probably keep an eye on that. Um, this mom is not making this up. And uh, she had just gotten into the hospital room, and they'd put the little Dora gown on her, and she coded and collapsed. And they pulled the cord and called a code blue. And the very first nurse that responded actually went to our church and just held my wife. Why my wife cried as she was helpless and could do absolutely nothing. And this lady just held her. And the doctor that responded, his partner, his, his, his partner in, in, in the ER tenure was the guy that I was with in Honduras. And so all of a sudden the phone rings in Honduras Why we're praying. And they're like, the doctor's talking to Brad and he said, hey, and Brad comes in and says, Mike, I need to talk to you. I was like, what, what's going on? He's like, your daughter just coded and they don't know if she's going to make it. And we recognized in that moment that we were praying for my daughter. And um, they resuscitated her. They, they brought her back. They intubated her. They life flighted her to a, a bigger hospital. Um, it was, I mean, there, at that point in time, there was no way I could have even left at the moment. So the next day, uh, my wife and I had a conversation again on the phone. And I'm like, babe, what do you want me to do? And she goes, I know this sounds crazy, but you're supposed to stay. She's like, there's, there's going to be just, this, this trip has got spiritual attacks all over it. You need to stay and be there. And I was like, are you sure? Like, like our daughter just coded. And she goes, I know, I know this sounds nuts, but she's like, God spoke to me. You need to stay. And she's like, I need your head in the game. I need you to stay down there and take care of whatever's going to happen. I was like, okay. Like, like. I feel that same thing. I have that same peace. That's not what I expected you to say, but I, I'm with you. Like, I actually agree. And um, 
the rest of that trip, we had four more incidences uh, where we almost lost a, a, a youth leader and students um, just from, I mean, a bee sting, uh, high, highly allergic. Someone got cashew or a nut that they weren't supposed to have. I mean, just, just crazy things. And all we could do was pray. Um, and we did. We prayed. And uh, that church in PA came around our family in a way of community like I had never seen before. And for three days, my, my daughter was in PICU, and my wife obviously never left her side, but the church never left my wife's side. There was somebody there the whole time, day and night. They made sure she bathed herself. They made sure she ate meals. They took care of our kids. And it was community, right? And it was the most precious thing I have ever experienced in my life. And that, and that carried on for us even in Africa when our daughter got pink eye and, and other things. And I, again, I could tell you story after story, um, but you don't want to listen to my stories all night. But followers in the way of Jesus engage in community. We belong in community. Like Jerry alluded to it last night. Like when God created man, he said it's not good that he's alone. And, and yes, he created woman, and, and, and woman becomes our, health, our, our life partner and our helpmate. But more importantly, it's community. I mean, could you imagine if we literally just talked to dogs all the time? Like, that'd get really boring. Like, we were made for community. And in the garden, it says that God and Adam and Eve were together. Because when Adam and Eve had sinned, they were hiding because it was, their, it was their normal afternoon walk with God. I don't know what that looks like. I'm longing for the day that we get to do that again. But it was clear that it was a part of their life cycle. It was a part of their community because God was walking in the garden looking for them. We're designed for community. We belong in community. And I think we've seen what isolation does over the last couple years in, in new ways than we could have ever imagined. And we live in a world and we live in the West where we want to isolate. We encourage isolation. We want to build our own little kingdom. It's all about me, 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 me. And the early church modeled this idea of community. And again, some communities do this really well and some don't. And I don't know a ton about New York. I think from what I've seen that you guys do community better than other places. And if you do, awesome. Then you can kind of ignore what I'm saying right now. But we belong in community. We walk with others in intimacy, accountability. We're known to each other. And as we're known, transformation takes place. This includes carrying each other's burdens, sharing our passions, being connected in a way that we feel the joys and sorrows of one another. In the same way that that church carried our burdens with our daughter, there was joys in that and there were sorrows in that. But again, there was a connection there that became so intense. Yet that was the same community that said, you guys got to go to Africa. We love you, but, but you got to go there. And are we willing to carry each other's burdens? Are we willing to share those passions? Are we willing to be connected in a way that we can feel joys and sorrows? I think some of us are. I think some of us, it's really scary, as it should be, right? But this is what church is. This is what church should be. Is it going to get messy? Absolutely. Because we're sinners, and we screw up, and we stumble, and we fall, and we're not perfect. But as our world continues to deteriorate, and as things continue to happen, we're going to need each other more than we ever imagined. We're going to need that strength to get through the day. We're going to need that strength to stand up for truth. Our kids are being faced with things that none of us ever imagined would happen. And some of the things that we walk through as students looks like nothing compared to what our kids are walking through today. And they're going to need community. They need a place that's speaking truth. They need a place that's teaching the gospel. They need a place that's praying for them that they know is safe. Because we can't hide from the world. We have to live in the world. We are salt. We are light. We are the only hope of the world because of who we are in Jesus, not because of who we are. Jesus is what gives us that hope and it lets us be that salt and light. And we got to let 
down some of these walls and be willing to walk with each other, be willing to get a little bit raw at times, a little bit passionate at times. I remember that same church a couple years after <clears throat> Micah, this was about a year before we went to Africa, and I, we, we had a, a fall camp retreat every year at Camp Hebron, about an hour away, and uh, we, had just got, we had just arrived. We had just driven the hour, got down there, and I get a phone call uh, just from a guy that was, was in a small group that I was in. He's like, dude, I, I screwed up. Like, I screwed up royally. And I was like, well, you know, where are you? He's like, I'm on your porch. He's like, my wife kicked me out. Like, like I cannot go back there. He's like, where, where are you? I said, uh, I'm at Camp Hebron. And I mean, he was bawling. He was a mess. It was a disaster. And he's like, I don't know what to do. And I said, just stay there. I'm coming. So I looked at Karen and the kids. And I said, hey, I, I, I got to go back and be with, with Brother Paul. And told Karen what's going on. She's like, yeah, go. She's like, we're, we're at camp. Like, we got food. We got rooms. We got swimming pools and places to play. Like, we'll be good. Like, go. And so I, I started calling some other guys. And by the time I got back to my house, there was six of us there. And we just, we just sat with Paul. We listened. We cried. We challenged. And he goes, man, this is not what I expected. I expected you guys all to judge me tell me I was a loser, you know, whatever it was. And I just remember looking at him and going, dude, we are all wretched, miserable seniors that need Jesus. <laughs> None of us have any right to judge you and call you out because we've all been there in one way or another. And Paul ended up living with us for six months in our basement. Uh, at times that was awkward, uh, but it was good. And I saw Paul transform and I saw him run back to Jesus and then he moved back into his home. And he lived in the basement there for a while. And then he eventually moved back upstairs. And I saw a marriage re restored and renewed. And today, Paul and Becky do marriage ministry in that same church, helping other couples walk through some of the very same things they walked through. And it was a beautiful story of community, carrying each other's burdens, carrying each other's passions, watching transformation take place, not giving up on people, and being there through some really, really messy situations. But today they've taken that and they're helping others. And it's, it's absolutely amazing to me. And I firmly believe in the church we need community more than ever. It's, it's, it's not going to get easier as, as we look at the world, as we read the news, as we read what's going on, like we are going to need each other. And we have to get beyond the, hey, how you doing? I'm fine. Did you have a good day? Yeah. How was work? Yeah, it was good. Now, again, I'm not expecting you to do that with every single person in the room. I'm not expecting you to do that with every single person. But, man, you need some people in your life that you can carry stuff. And we need to be churches that look like that, that look like this early church and are there for each other. So community. This next one is missional living. And we're really going to talk about this tomorrow night. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. We're going to kind of get practical, share some examples. Uh, we're actually going to watch uh, a video. So that's uh, by the skit guys. So I, I hope you'll come back for that. But I just want to read it. Followers in the way of Jesus are giving them themselves away like our Lord. The New Testament terminology that describes this as a withness, a mongness, and a long-sidedness. And again, if you guys pay attention, all of these things work together, right? Prayer and scripture, we're praying about who to be with, we're dedicated to scripture, we're applying it, we're in community, we're doing this amongness, we're doing this withness, we're doing this alongsideness, and missional living begins to kind of come out of us. This is done across the street and across the world. This is done with those sitting next to you. Relationships with people is far greater than anything the church has to offer. And I hope you understand what I mean by that. We are the church, right? The building is not a church. The building is a building. We like the building, right? It's very nice to be inside and not out in the cold right now. It's very nice to be, like in Ohio, it's nice to be inside in the summer. You guys clearly don't have hot summers, which is awesome. Like you can do tent church. That's so cool. 
But relationships with people is far greater than anything the church has to offer. And, and I'm not saying we shouldn't do our programs, and I'm not saying we shouldn't get together. Clearly, as a body, we should worship together. We should have youth. We should have programs. We should reach out to our community. But all of that really is based on relationships. This is just where we do relationships. The building is just a building. You can do church under a tree. You can do church on a porch. You can do church in McDonald's. You can do church in a truck stop. You can do church at a rest stop. You can do church anywhere because we are the church. But we have to build relationships. The, the foundation of living missionally and doing everything that we've been talking about is that relationships. And if we don't have relationships with people, they're not going to trust us. They're not going to listen to us. And they're sure, most likely, not going to walk in the doors of a church. Maybe once or twice. But if there's no relationship, they're going to sit in that back row. Maybe move up to the middle. And then eventually just kind of fade off into the darkness. And I've seen it time and time again. And you probably have too. Relationships with people is far greater than anything the church has to offer. Missional living. And like I said, we're going to really dive into that tomorrow night. The last thing is multiplication. So took a picture of what looks like a cell and it's multiplying, it's becoming more than one. Followers in the way of Jesus are always sensitive to those who do not yet know the Lord. They are sent often leaving the comfortable to pursue mercy and justice. They enter into the world, build relationships with the world, and help others connect their story to God's. We were called to multiply, right? Jerry talked about it last night. Israel was called to bring other nations to Israel, a place that would be safe, a place that would be different, a place that would look like any, like unlike any other country in the world. And they didn't quite understand that. And so the church was called to that same thing. And I love in this passage, it says, That they were doing these things, right? They were devoted to prayer. They were devoted to scripture. They had community. They were living missionally. They were helping people. They were taking care of needs. And I love that it says, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So as they were doing all these things and as they were connected, the Lord is stirring in people's hearts and the Lord is adding to their number. Because it starts with that prayer element and that scripture element. It starts with him. And guys, I firmly, firmly, firmly believe that when we do those first four things well, multiplication begins to come somewhat naturally. If we are devoted to prayer, if we are devoted to scripture, if we are devoted to community and missional living, people want to know why we're Jesus freaks. To quote DC Talk, which really was to quote Brendan Manning, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Jesus, who is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out their door, and get on with their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. And I firmly believe, and I've seen it in my own life, that when we are already in prayer and God is beginning to put people in our mind to pray for, and we're reading scripture and we're being prompted, and we're living in community, and people are challenging us, and we're living missionally, multiplication, we have to do our part, we have to build relationships, we have to enter into the world, we have to open our mouths, but it does begin to happen somewhat naturally. People literally come up to you and go, why are you weird? Why are you different? Why do you do the things you do? Why don't you do the things of the world? You actually practice what you preach. Why? And you begin to have those relationships. Now, they don't always ask those questions that way, but they just want to know what's going on. And that multiplication begins to happen as that relationship is built and you begin to interact with that person. And some of them are right away, right? Some people come to the Lord right away, and some are years in the making. My best friend in high school was not a believer. He was a guy I worked with actually at the gas station. And he was a couple years older than me. So he was, he was out of high school, but he was just, just a great friend. But he was living in the world. And I mean, you name it, I helped him out of messes. And I was just, I was there for him. And and I was, picked him up when he shouldn't be driving. And I, I was just, I was in a relationship and it got messy. 
But I'll never forget, we had been friends for 10 years, 10 years, and we had watched football games together and gone to movies together and laughed and cried together, all kinds of stuff. And that day, he lost his job and his wife walked out on him in the same day. He was not having a good day. And he calls me up. We were no longer working together. I was actually as a youth pastor by then and, and he was in another line of work. And he calls me up and he says, Mike, I need Jesus. I was like, what? I was like, I mean, I, literally, I shouldn't have said what, but I did. I was like, what? And he's like, you have been there through thick and thin and you've been telling me about Jesus. You've modeled Jesus. You've, you've been there for me. And he goes, I've lost everything. He goes, and I just realized I need Jesus. And I was like, sweet. Like, like do you want to talk on the phone? You want me to come over? He's like, man, just come over. And, and so again, I went over and prayed with him. And, and he gave his life to the Lord, ended up baptizing him a couple weeks later. Uh, and to this day, he's, he's an elder in his church and he leads Bible studies. And he helps guys get out of addictions because that was kind of his story. But again, it was 10 years of building that relationship and being in a messy relationship. And, and some are even longer. I think that's one of the hardest things about some of our RI workers, right? They're working amongst Muslim people. And sometimes you work forever and you just don't see a lot of fruit. So whether we're talking to people next door, whether we're talking to people across the street, whether we're talking to people across the world, we enter into the world, we build relationships, and we help others connect their story to God. Because every single one of us has a story. And all of our stories are important. Because our story is how we figured out who God was and what God means to us. And we begin to surrender those things in our life to serve and honor God with the gifts that he's given us. So to end this evening, we're going to do another little community thing. So we've talked about community and we've talked about a little bit about missional living. We talked a little bit about here about multiplication. And so again, I want you to get back in those same groups because you've already built a little bit of a relationship. You've got some community going on. And I just want you to share in that group somebody that's in your life that you know that God has either asked you to reach out to or that you're working with, and just share a, a little bit about that story and just how we can pray for you. So in your group, you're gonna be practicing community, you're gonna be practicing sharing openly, you're gonna do some praying, but yeah, just share like, man, I have this person. Or maybe, maybe God's been giving you that person and you haven't gone and talked to them yet, or you've been afraid to go talk to them and you actually need the boldness to, tonight to just go, yeah, I really need to go have that conversation. But if we're going to live missionally in our communities, it starts in our communities and sometimes even in our own families. Um, and so, yeah, just take a couple minutes and just share somebody in your life or somebody that you should be in your life, maybe, and just a way that we can pray for you. So, yeah, go back to those groups and take a couple minutes to do that. this story that will launch us even into missional living tomorrow night. And then if you want to continue talking and sharing, please do. Um, but I want to be respectful of those who have young children as well who need to get home for bed. You know, last night we talked about reach and just the impact that it can have on a young person's life and how much we feel it's a huge aspect and just love to see kids take that gap year. And uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with a man named Burl Forrester or not, he was born in Lyleville. I grew up in this area, and I don't remember if he attended Krogan or Carthage, but he attended one, one of those churches um, as a young man. Um, and at 19 years old, he did, at that time, what was VS, right? There was no yes or reach. There was VS, and he went and served in Morocco for one year, and just absolutely fell in love with West Africa. And uh, Knew, knew that that's where he wanted to be. And so he came back and the doors were shut. He wasn't, wasn't able to go back. Went to school. 
you know, found a girl, got married, had some kids, uh, began a career, began a life, but could never get Africa out of his head. Like it was just always there. Fast forward 40 years, he's now 60 years old. Um, his, his, there was some mental stuff with his wife, and so she was no longer in the picture, actually was, was in a hospital. Um, so there was some other stuff, unfortunate situations that happened there. Um, but he was at a stage of life where he was like, what's next? And so he signed up to go on mercy ship for six months. Because mercy ship's always looking for people to come and work for three or six months to let people have vacations and home leave. And so he went and volunteered for six months to just be a mechanic on the ship. And while I was on the ship, uh, they landed in Gambia in West Africa. And they were there doing their work and all the surgeries and everything was happening right there in Banjul, Gambia. And so he began to leave the ship each day and build relationships and start talking to some guys. And he found some just men of peace and men that were believers. And he finished up his time on Mercy Ship, came back to America and sold everything. He had, he had by this point in time, he had made it out to Oregon. He had a huge fruit farm there, a very successful fruit farm and had hazelnuts and other things, uh, and he sold it all at 60 years old, and he moved back to West Africa. And he continued to serve there until he was 80 years old, and God called him home. And he just had a passion for the unreached. And he started in Gambia and moved his way down to Guinea-Bissau, eventually down to guinea Conakry, which is where he was at, planting a church. Uh, when he got sick, and within 24 hours, God called him home. Again, he was, was 80 um, but he had finished his race. But today, there's give or take 15 churches in what they call Mennonite Church West Africa, in Gambia, in Guinea-Bissau, Guinea-Conakry, and, the, and they're beginning to plant churches. They're trying to plant one in Senegal in the southern part, all because of a young man who went on a VS trip at 19 years old. And so... As we start to look at missional living, I, I share that story to say no matter what stage of life you are in, God uses you. And again, I'm not saying you're supposed to sell everything and go to Africa. That was Burl's journey. But Burl was used at 19, and then he had a stage of life where it looked normal. And then God changed that, and at 60, he went and served. And so no matter what spectrum, we have 19-year-olds in here. We probably have some 60-year-olds in here. We have, maybe have a few older, we maybe have a few younger, but my point is God uses us all. So if you're still kicking, and you're still here, and you're still breathing, then you can still be used by God. And God wants to still use you. And again, it might be right here in the community. It might be simple as going into a local nursing home and just spending time with people that literally have no one, that don't get visitors, that no one talks to. I, I don't know. But don't think that you can't live missionally because of an age. Because God uses the body no matter where the body is at, as long as the body is willing. And by the body, I mean the church. And so I just, I wanted to leave you with that story of Burl, because, I mean, he was clearly an inspiration to me, and just amazing what he did. But more importantly, that he wasn't afraid to obey even at 60 years old and at 19. Um, so I just want to encourage you that if God's been putting something on your heart, again, someone to talk to, someone to reach out to, whatever it may be, don't think you can't because you're too young or too old or somewhere in the middle. Because if God's putting it in your heart, he probably wants you to do it. So I'm going to just pray for our evening and, and then you guys can continue your conversations. But then if you need to jet or be dismissed, you're also will be welcome to do that as well. But Again, let me just pray for us, and you guys can continue talking uh, as, as needed. So, Lord, we just thank you for this evening. God, I thank you for these basic principles, these basic elements that you gave us in the early church. Lord, I, just, I thank you for the, the devotion that we saw of the early church to, to praying to your word, to each other, to community, to church life, to living missionally, to living like you, to giving away of themselves God, we see that as we continue to walk through Acts, with appointing deacons to help with food distribution, with Stephen being the first martyr, with the council, with Antioch, 
and eventually sending out missionaries with Paul and Barnabas and others. God, we see the multiplication that begins to take place. Lord, I just pray that these will be elements in our lives, that, that they'll be evident in our personal lives, they'll be evident in our marriages and our families, and ele- evident in our churches. That these would be foundations that we don't stray from, that these would be foundations that we see as scriptural and biblical and needed, and they would be things that we gu- guard and hold on to, and be willing to get rid of some of the extra stuff that isn't or shouldn't need to be there. And God, as we do these things, I just pray that it will begin to open our hearts and minds of how we can live missional all around us, no matter where you've put us, even just shopping at Walmart, Lord, just looking for people that maybe need a word of encouragement, maybe just need you to have a quick prayer with them, maybe need you to pay their bill, I don't know. But God, that we'll have those eyes and those ears and have that attentive spirit up to what you're doing and how you're using us each and every day. And that won't be something that we do at church or on mission trips, but this would be our lives, that we would be that salt and light each and every day. In your name we pray, amen.